What do you know about it, Chigelski? What do any of us know about anything? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the channel. Thanks for stopping by. I've done a handful of videos that demo some of the capabilities of my 6502 base single board computer, the JJ65CO2. Admittedly, not a very imaginative name. For this video series, however, I'm going to go into a little bit more depth about the actual board itself. We'll start off with a overview of a populated PCB and the chips that are on it and the functionality they provide, after which we'll actually talk about the schematics, the architecture, the design, and the software that actually gets everything up and running. Okay, uh, here is the board right here. Starting at the upper left of the board is the ROM. This uh, system is built and wired, assuming the use of the AT28C286 chip right here. The disadvantage about using this chip, however, is that first of all, there is some limited availability uh, of it. And secondly, which I think is the, the biggest issue, is that it is incredibly slow. So it significantly limits the maximum speed that you can run the board under. So to get around that, I'm actually using this chip instead. This is the DS1230Y NV RAM chip. And what I like about that is in addition to it being much, much faster than the old chip, it is pin to pin compatible. So you really can just take out the old chip, program the new one, drop it right on in, and it works as is. No changes are needed for the logic. No rewiring is required. It really is a drop in replacement. The disadvantage or the problem with the chip is that it is significantly more expensive. I managed to find this on sale for about $15 US. Normally, it's around the low to mid-20s or so. So long term, I don't think I'll be baselining this chip. But as a workaround for the, the old EEPROM, it's a pretty good alternative. Now, next to the ROM is the RAM chip. I'm actually using a, a larger chip. Uh, it provides 128K uh, kilobytes of RAM space right here. Uh, the model number is the Alliance Memory AS6C1008. And the reason why I'm using a larger chip is I'm actually implementing memory banking on the board. And that allows me to access more than 64K, which is the limit for all 16-bit uh, addressed uh, platforms out there. And so by using the memory banking, I can add a lot more uh, capability and a lot more access to RAM and take advantage of the higher space of that chip. Next to the RAM is the 6522, the VIA chip. This is the main interface between the CPU and the external world out there. Uh, basically anything that has to uh, be sent to or from the system console, as well as some other things, is handled via the VIA chip right there. And we'll talk about that and how it does that a little bit later on. Next to the VIA chip is the actual CPU. This is the 65C02. Uh, I'm using the newer chip, obviously, so we can handle the higher clock speeds associated with it. But also, I like taking advantage of the newer opcodes that the 65CO2 provides. It just makes programming a little bit uh, easier, saves a little bit of cycles and stuff like that. So I'm baselining uh, that. And in fact, I think most modern 6502 platforms are using the 65C02. Now, next to the CPU is a Raspberry Pi Pico. And I'm using this as sort of like an external IOAV chip. 
It's responsible for uh, sound generation. It's also responsible for uh, taking the PS2 keyboard input and you know coordinating that communication with the, the CPU, any console output, uh, text mode, graphics mode, things of that nature are handled by the Raspberry Pi Pico and go out through the VGA interface right here. There's enough going on with this chip that I think it deserves its own video, which I'll be producing uh, a little bit later on. Next to that is the triple five timer chip. And I'm using that basically as a power on or reset delay. That gives the entire system time to stabilize before we actually power up and start running the CPU right here. Now, most of the board, uh, most of the chips, most of the signals are running at five volts DC, but there are some occasional signals that require 3.3 volts. And that's what this device right here does. It takes the five volts coming in from the USB-C connector right here, converts it to 3.3, and then distributes it out as needed. As I mentioned, this is the, the USB-C connector, which we're using as an input power supply, providing five volts. Now to avoid some of the wear and tear in connecting and disconnecting uh, the, the power USB cord, I have a switch right here that allows this to remain uh, connected, but to turn the system on and off quite easily. Below that is the VGA, a connector right here, standard VGA pinout. Below that is the PS2 keyboard pinout. Again, very standard. And as a reminder, both of these are controlled and managed by the Raspberry Pi Pico. Below the PS2 keyboard is this really nice development board. Uh, it's actually based on the Max 232 chip right there. And it basically is the chip that takes the RS-232 signals uh, that are coming in and outputs it via a USB connector. And I like this rather than the old style um, boards that, that did that. Uh, first of all, because it is significantly smaller, as you can see, it takes up uh, much less of the real estate that this old board does. And because it's a direct USB connector, you don't have to look around for this, uh, this cable right here that does the RS-232 connector to USB connector. It's all built inside of the development board right there. This is a standard 3.5 millimeter audio jack output for the sound. Now right here, you'll see some, uh, some circuitry and some devices for on-board audio amplification. Not exactly uh, sure if I'll continue with that. I'm not really happy with the performance of it, and it really doesn't seem to make much sense doing that audio amplification here on the board and the possible issues with, uh, with noise and that nature. I think most probably what I'll do is remove that entire uh, piece of circuitry and just take the audio output that's coming from the Raspberry Pi Pico attenuating that signal, and then uh, outputting that uh, directly to an externally powered speaker. Above the uh, 386, which was the, uh, the, the op amp, is the ACIA chip, the 6551. This is the chip that implements the RS-232 protocol, which is another way of communicating to the outside world via the RS-232 interface. Um, currently, uh, it does not use hardware handshaking. And so if you bump up the speed, uh, the baud rate a little bit higher, you will get some errors, but uh, up to about, you know, 19K baud, it's very, very solid and reliable. Now, as with most systems, there is some glue logic required, some signaling logic and, and things of that nature. And so uh, this chip, which is the 64HC00, provides uh, a series of NAND gates that we use inside of there. That's what that, that chip right there is for. Now, previously I talked about how we're having uh, both uh, five volts DC and 3.3 volts DC. Uh, in particular, the Raspberry Pi, even though we're powering it by five volts, 
all the signals that are on the GPI, uh, GPIO pins are actually at 3.3 volts, or not five volt tolerant. So we need some way of converting either the 3.3 volts to five volts or the five volts to 3.3 volts. And that's what these three boards right here do. They are actually based on the TXB0108 bi-directional logic converter chips right here. These are just a larger uh, development boards. Uh, I believe they're through Adafruit. Uh, and what they did basically do is sees what signals are on one side and converts them to the correct voltage uh, on the other side as well. I think most probably later on, I might be actually removing the actual development boards themselves and actually putting the, the chips, which are surface mounted directly on the board to save some real estate right there. Next to those uh, chips are the two clock circuits. This is the 1.8 megahertz that powers the RS-232 interface. And this is the system clock interface currently at four megahertz. And finally, right here at the very, very top is a programmable uh, logic device. This is actually the Atmel ATF 22V 10C. As I mentioned before, when I was talking about the NAND gate, sometimes you have to do a lot of address decoding, uh, logic decoding and things like that. And so you're creating these uh, these logic circuits. And although you, though you could do it with a bunch of these chips, it takes a lot of real estate. You can actually program this to, to handle all of the address decoding and other internal logic inside. Uh, the two nice things about that is that it saves a heck of a lot of real estate. You don't have a number of these larger chips. You just have this one. But the other great thing about it is that Assuming that the wiring is correct, uh, you don't need to change any of that. You just need to actually change the actual logic itself. You can actually pop this chip out, uh, reprogram it, pop it back in. And so your address logic decoding functionality uh, is much, much easier to change on the fly by using a, a PLD rather than discrete circuits right here. Um, now I am thinking about other changes to go on uh, on this uh, on this board for the next revision. I already mentioned getting rid of the onboard uh, audio amplification and getting rid of these development boards and actually putting the uh, the surface mounted uh, TXB um, 0108s directly on the board. Uh, another one I'm thinking about is actually doing array away with um, with the, the the ROM set up the way it is right now, a lot of people are actually migrating over to flash RAM, in particular the SST39SF family. Uh, that does require rewiring because it is a larger chip in the same way that this, uh, this RAM chip was a larger chip than what most people uh, and Ben either has used on his uh, platform and his design. But I really think that the um, the change is worth it because not only are the SST chips uh, readily available, uh, they are also significantly less expensive than, than this as well. So I think those are gonna be the three main changes on the next generation of this uh, this board right here. And I think that's a good place to end this video. I don't want these videos to run too long and risk people getting even more bored than they would otherwise. Next one will be about the actual schematics. So hope to see you then.